Good morning, Walden Church. Uh, today, as a start, I wanted to read Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. It says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Here the psalmist reminds us that we are individually handcrafted. Each one of us, we are handmade, we are knit together by God. You could even say that we are works of art. God wants to give us joy, and he wants to give us our best life because we are his, we are his creation. And the best life is not about something that you have to, to do. You already have that, it's a guarantee because of what God is doing for you and what God does through you and how God changes you. God's work in your life should change how you see yourself. It should change the person that you see in the mirror. 1 John 3 says, see what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. See, right away, you are loved by God simply because you are his child, not because of anything that you do. And God wants to give you your very best life. And so this fall, we've been discussing what that means. Not according to talk shows, not according to the news, not according to self-help books or your favorite podcast, but what does it mean to live your best life, the way that God wants you to live. And this morning I thought we would go back, let's revisit where we've come so far. Because I think sometimes when you're in a sermon series like this, it's easy to get lost and to forget the steps that have taken you on the journey. And so uh, we've been offering up all of these small pieces of advice, these small changes that we can make, these small shifts we can make in our life, either in our lifestyle or in our schedule, that help us align more with God. So this morning I thought, well, let's just recap, right? Let's go back, let's recap. And the very first week we said we needed to move, we needed to make a shift from sadness to celebration. Philippians 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means Christians are supposed to be joy-filled people. We're not supposed to be doom and gloom. We're not supposed to be nervous or scared. We're not supposed to live in fear. We're not supposed to be looking for a conspiracy theory uh, from the news or from the government or for, from Big Pharma. Christians are supposed to be filled with joy. God has love for us, like we just said, right? God loves us. His joy goes in. His love goes in to us. And so that means joy comes out of us. And church, when we come to church, this is the place where we get to meet that powerful, amazing God who made us, who knit us together, who loves us, so that even more should make us joy-filled. And it should show on our faces, it should show when we worship, it should show when we smile, and when we clap, when we raise our hands, when we sing. And in fact, what we might shout out hallelujah, right? We shout out hallelujah when we sing or when we uh, are listening to a sermon. Hallelujah is a, is a compound word. Hal, Hallel, means to praise. And it's uh, uh, a short word uh, that, that is the beginning of the first part. And the, the second part of the word, Yah, right? Yah, that's the beginning of Yahweh, which is the beginning of God's name. So hallelujah literally means to praise God. But wait, there's even more than that. Hallel can also mean to move in a circle, which would imply dancing, to celebrate. So whenever we say hallelujah, what we're really saying is my heart and my soul is filled with joy. My heart and my soul sings and praises and dances to God 
Worship is my response to all that God does for me. So joy is not something that happens to me. Joy is a choice I make. I choose to celebrate. I choose to be joyful. And it's not dependent on my circumstance. I'm not walking around saying, well, I'm, I'm sad because of all the sad things that have happened to me. According to the Bible, the Christian is supposed to be joy-filled. And that's one of the keys to living our best life. Second, we need to shift our focus from ourselves to God. Revelation 5 says, Then I looked and heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voices of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. John has a vision. He gets to see heaven. He gets to see the thing that we all want to see. And John does his very best to describe it to you. And he says, okay, this is what I see. I see God in the center on a throne. And then surrounding God, I see these concentric circles that go in and circle out. And everyone in heaven, the myriads, the hundreds, the thousands of people that are in heaven, the, the kings, the queens, the altars, the, the, the beasts, the angels, all of the creatures, everyone faces inward. Everyone faces inward and they praise the one who is on the throne. All of heaven, all creation praises God. And, and, it, and the Bible says they all say amen, right? Amen means true. So a voice says God is to be worshipped. God is to be praised. And all the myriads and the thousands of thousands of creatures that live in heaven shout back true. They shout back yes. You know, when John the Baptist was in his ministry and at the peak of his ministry that's when jesus entered the scene and began his own ministry and john's disciples ran to john and said you are losing followers you are losing likes you are losing subscribers what are you going to do about your popularity john 3 his disciples say rabbi he who was with you across the jordan to whom you bore witness look he is baptizing and all are going to him and john answered a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, and the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must de decrease. See, here we have John's disciples, and they're worried. John, you're losing popularity. It, your, your crowd is going down. You're not going viral anymore. What are you going to do? And John says, look, it was never about me. It's not about me. <laughs> he must increase. I must decrease. Because when we see this picture that John paints for us about heaven, John the Apostle, he says, it's God that sits on the throne, not me. I don't want to sit on the throne. All of creation worships God. It doesn't worship me. So the center of heaven is God. And if there is a center to heaven, then there is a center to all of creation. And it's not me. The world does not revolve around me. The Bible says that that throne is not mine. That chair is not mine. But how often in my week, in my day-to-day, -day, am I so consumed with my needs and my schedule and my family and my household and my job and my addiction and my pain and my stress and my wealth or my lack of wealth or my power or my lack of power or my happiness or my sadness and I make life all about me and I make my attitude and my sadness or my joy based on my circumstances and I make life about me and not God. John says it's not about you. It's not about you. Life is not about you. It's about the one who sits on the throne. I have to shift myself. I have to turn and face the throne. I need to face the center of heaven, and my shift needs to be off of myself and onto God. He must become greater. I must become less. Our third shift was from snacking on the Bible to feasting on the Bible. 
2 Timothy says all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Timothy lists out four different things that the Bible does for you. It teaches you. It shows you your, your sin, right? The Bible, Timothy says it rebukes you, so it corrects you when you're wrong, and it trains you to become better. You know, we, we, have, we have the Word of God everywhere. We probably have a Bible in several different rooms in our house. It's on our radio, it's on TV. Uh, we might even have the Bible on CD or DVD. You can access the Bible on the internet. Uh, the, the Bible's on your computer. It, the Bible is being beamed to us from satellites. We read the Bible quoted in other books that we read. Uh, we can uh, have a speaker uh, quote the Bible in a conference or in, on, on a sermon. And, and there's more than 450 English translations of the Bible. 450 different English translations of the Bible. And yet we're, we're dying. We're thirsty from hunger and, and thirst. We are not getting enough Bible in our life. To live our best lives, we have to make this shift to placing more priority on the scriptures. Not, not surrounding ourselves with the scriptures, but consuming it. We need to take it in. You can see something so much that you, you then become blind to it. The word of God has to get inside of us because we have to start allowing that word to change us. Not just listening to it, but hearing it and obeying it. We need to sit down with this instruction manual and we need to start building our healthy life, building our best life. The Hebrew Bible says in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Verse 105 says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That's how important the Bible should be. To live our best life, it needs to be like food. For as much as you need food or water to live, the psalmist says, that's what I need. And not only is it, is it basic food, the psalmist says it's sweet food. It's like cake. It's like ice cream. It's like, this, it's like the sweetest thing. It's a joy. It's my dessert. And not only that, but it's my navigation as I walk through this world in darkness and fear and wonder. The Bible becomes the light from my path that tells me the direction I should go. How often are we praying or asking or wondering which choice should I take? And yet the psalmist reminds us, your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light from my path. Fourth, we need to make a shift from a monologue prayer to a dialogue prayer. How do you do that? Simple. You talk to God and you listen right? We need to talk to God and listen, not just talk to him. He's not a vending machine. He's not a genie in a lamp. You don't just rub the lamp and get the things that you ask for. We communicate with God. We tell God everything. So if we're happy, we tell him. If we're sad, we tell him. If we're struggling, we tell him. If we're confused, we tell him. If our heart is breaking, we tell him. If we're thrilled, we tell him. When you have a best friend and you feel comfortable sharing all the parts of your life with your best friend, that's what God wants too. God wants to be that best friend that you communicate with. Not just, you know, when you wake up or when you go to sleep or right before dinner. He wants to walk with you through your day. I mean, when you get to pray, you have access to the King of Kings. You have access to the creator of the universe. And if that's the case, then he deserves more from us. He deserves to be first. He deserves to be the priority of our life. He deserves to be the priority of our schedule. I, I, can't, I cannot say, I, I don't have time to pray. I just don't have time. I mean, where did the day go? I, I don't have time to pray. Jesus had a busy schedule. Everybody wanted to spend time with Jesus. People were always asking to be with him or, to, or to, to eat with him. And they were always grabbing him by the shirt and pulling him some direction. And yet Jesus made it a priority to pray, to talk to God, even Jesus. And we, we shouldn't do it because it's a chore. We shouldn't do it because we have to or it's a duty. You know, like we say, well, 
It's been a week. You should really call your parents. It's been, it's been a while. You really should call the kids. We, we should want to call God. We should want to call on him. We should want to pray because he's our heavenly father, because he loves us and we love him. Paul even says, pray without ceasing. In other words, don't even stop. Let every part of your communication be prayer. We should have our hearts and minds set on him always and, and be in constant dialogue with him. If we want to know God, if we want to have a relationship with him, if we want to live our best life, then we have to have more communication with God, more conversation with God. I know you want those supernatural things to take place in your life, but tell, I tr- t- trust me on this, nothing supernatural is ever going to happen in your life without prayer. If you want to unleash God's power in your life, if you want to unleash God's power in your neighborhood, God's power in your family, if you want to unleash God's power in your church, the key ingredient is going to be prayer. Prayer is going to be what makes that happen. All of those, you know, completely out of this world miracles that you hear about, they took place with prayer. But prayer is not a one-sided thing. It's not a monologue. It's a dialogue. Prayer is our relationship. Paul is our, prayer is our conversation. And it is between sheep and shepherd. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, which means we have to listen, right? It has to be a conversation. Fifth, we need to make a shift from rushing to slowing. Jesus says in Matthew, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, if you feel rushed and hurried, who doesn't, right? If you feel like your to-do list is only getting longer, if you feel like you have way too many deadlines and not enough breaks, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. And what does he promise you? Rest. He says, I will give you rest. That is a, that is a wonderful promise. That is a beautiful hope that Christ, our King, offers us rest. And I need it, right? I need it. In in a life where we experience so much, where we rarely get a chance to sit down and put our feet up, and if we do, we immediately fall asleep, life makes you tired. All this busyness, all this accomplishing, all this multitasking, it makes us exhausted. And so when we start reading the Bible, and the Bible talks about wanting to give us rest, wanting to give us a Sabbath, a day of rest, then we should pay attention. It shouldn't be the thing that's last on our list. It shouldn't be the thing that we sacrifice. Don't sacrifice your rest. Don't sacrifice rest for accomplishment or your to-do list. We all need it. We are supposed to take a Sabbath rest just like God took a Sabbath rest. Ecclesiastes 3 says, for everything there is a season and for every time, for every matter under heaven. That means means God gives us adequate time. He gives you 24 hours a day and that is enough. That is the same time he gives everybody else. We all have the same amount of time to accomplish the things that we need to do so we can slow down. There's a time for everything and God says, you know what, just manage your time better. I think the world teaches us to be busy. Our parents teach us to be busy. A school, our jobs teach us to be busy. In fact, the world never speaks about rest or slowness positively, right? Nothing positive is ever slow. But Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. That's God's advice. God's advice is to know that He is God that he is in control, that he can multitask, that he can accomplish. That's great advice. That means I can give God all my worry. I can give all my, my rushing about to God. I can give all my speed and multitasking and hurriedness to God. I can give it all to the God of the universe. And I can rest. I can rest assured that his will will still be done. Things will still be finished and resolved because he is in charge. It's his world. Sixth shift. I move from stuffing ourselves with food to being satisfied. 
Ezekiel 16 says, Now this is the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor or the needy. Do you remember learning about Sodom and Gomorrah in Sunday school? Maybe you had a Bible study where it was mentioned. Is that what you remember about Sodom, why Sodom was destroyed? Because they were overfed and they were not concerned about people who are hungry and needy? We should talk about food. We should talk about food more in church. We should because food is something that touches every single corner of our life. We all eat, right? And we all have moments in our day where we're asking, what's for dinner? What are we going to eat? What are you going to eat? What are you going to order? Food and how we treat it is a very big deal. And if we believe that God is God, right? He is the God of the universe. He is the creator of all things. He is in control of all things. The Bible says that he sees every single time a sparrow hops out of a tree. He sees every single hair on our head and numbers them. Then we have to also believe that God cares about every aspect of my life. And it's not just the words that I say or the promises I make, or, or it doesn't just, uh, he's not just only concerned with how I spend my money or how I worship, but he also cares about how I treat this, my body. He also cares about my health and how I interact with food and his creation. Eating is connected with survival. It's connected with the seasons. It's connected with the, the time and passing of the years. It teaches us patience. And yet, any day of the week, I can go to Whataburger and, and order a, a number five meal. How disconnected is that? That my food just shows up when I order it, and I can order anything I want, any way I want. And it comes to me quickly. I, it, I'm so disconnected from something that God made, right? God makes food and we consume it and we're stuffed. And then the food just becomes this commodity and it ceases to be sacred. It ceases to have rhythm. Food ceases to teach us patience. Food even teaches us to hurry and to rush. In fact, I'll go so far as to say that the technology that we have to grow food, harvest food, ship food, consume food fast, it separates us from what it's supposed to be. It separates us from the creation that God designed it to be. Genesis 1 says, God said, let the land produce vegetation and seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit and the seed in it according to their various kinds and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Chapter 2, verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care of it. That's the beginning of the Bible, the very beginning of the story. God creates the world, the animals and the plants, and he looks at all of it, the ground, the trees, the water, and he says, this is good. And then, he's, and then he points right at us, and he says, you're in charge. You're in charge of all of this. You are responsible for creation. We need to connect better with our food and the world around us. Romans 12 says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. You know, when we can have our food any time, in any season, in 15 minutes or less, what are we sacrificing? Are we sacrificing anything? When technology can bring you your food so quickly? You know, in the Old Testament, God lived in a temple. In the New Testament, God lived in a temple. And it was beautiful. It was ornate. It was detailed. Every single little nuance, every measurement, every color, every paint stripe, the wood that was used, all of it is detailed in the Bible. God was so meticulous about how he wanted his temple to be built and how beautiful it was supposed to be. People would come from thousands of miles away to see this beautiful structure, and it was the place where God lived. Where does God live now? Ask a little child, 
where Jesus lives. Where, what would they say? Jesus lives in my heart, right? Jesus lives in me. Now I'm the temple. I'm the temple. Is my temple beautiful? Is my temple a testimony to all that God does for me and blesses me with? He dwells in me. I, I should keep this temple of his in good repair. So I know you love food, but may your love for food spill over into your love for God. And may your taste buds reconnect with creation and God's design. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Seventh, we need to move from being anxious, we need to move from anxiety to being people of peace. Philippians 4 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church in California, he says, worry is the warning light that God is really not first in my life at this particular moment. Because worry says that God is not big enough to handle my trouble. Even Jesus told us, told his disciples, do not worry. In the Sermon on the Mount, his most famous sermon, when he could have said anything, taught anything, he chose to speak on worry. Even the people who lived back then, we think, oh, back then life was simple. Oh, to have lived back in a simpler time. You think people didn't worry and weren't anxious? weren't still rushing about, nervous, fret, fretting, scared. Matthew 6, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can even add a single hour to his span of life. Notice Jesus isn't sitting on the hillside and teaching his disciples how to develop an effective, worry-filled life. Jesus never says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the anxious, for they will have a heart attack. Right? <laughs> blessed are those who are constantly experiencing worry and anxieties, for they will see the emergency room. He could have. That's what worry does to a person. That's what stress does to a person. We weren't created to live that way. That is not how God wants us to live. That is not living your best life. Anxiety and stress is escalating. As our busy lives are escalating, as our to-do list is escalating, as we shove more terrible food into our body, it's all killing us. And worse than that, it's making us less in our faith. It's depreciating our faith. And that's where we left off last week. And we have two more weeks to go after this. And then we'll get to Halloween. And then we'll, and it'll be Thanksgiving. And then it'll be Christmas. And just be, I just thought, you know what? Before the holidays, before all that busyness starts to come uh, and, and the crowds and the to-do lists, I just wanted to remind you once again, I just wanted to pause and remind you once again, your best life is possible. And it's not because you're doing as much as Dick and Jane. And it's not because you have more followers than the Joneses. Your best life is available, chiefly because God loves you. And he wants to give that best life to you. John 3 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We all know that verse, right? We know that verse. But we have to read it and live it in the context that Jesus says it in. John 3, 16 and 17 says that the very core of the Christian message is that God loves you and God wants you to know it. 
That's why when you look at yourself in the mirror, you're not judging yourself based on what the world thinks of you, and it's not even what your inner voice says of you. When we look in the mirror, we have to see the person that God sees, and God sees his child. God sees his creation. God sees the one whom he loves. And in John 3, we are told God sent Jesus to love us, to save us, to rescue us, to suffer for us, to bear our sin, to rise again for us. That's huge news. Huge news. And it should change the way we live. We should want to live our best life. Not the life that we've carved out for ourselves. Not the life that the world tells us to live. We don't need to watch TV and those commercials and eat that food and wear those clothes and drive that truck and live in that place and go on those vacations. Everything we need is in his word. And the person we see in the mirror should be the person that God sees. That we are a person of value because we are a child of God. We are a person of worth because we are a child of God. And we are Jesus' followers. And that's the message we should be sending to, out into the world. Not just to ourselves, but out into the world. We need to preach John 3.16. The world needs to know that they are loved. The world needs to know that they have worth and value. And that they don't have to listen to the news and the media. They don't have to read the magazines they don't have to try to measure up like we all do. Because right now, your next door neighbor feels judged. Your friends at work feel condemned. The other parents at the school, they feel cast aside. And we all feel too fat and too short and too single. And our job as the church is to push this message out. He must increase. I must decrease. It's his world and his message. And his message to the world is, I love the world. I want to give you your best life. I am your shepherd. You are the sheep. I am your parent. I am your father. You are children of God created in my image. We got we to gotta preach that message. We got to be louder than the world. That message needs to be louder than the world. The secret to living your best life is knowing that God loves you. He welcomes you. He accepts you. And he wants to live with you and be with you forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen? All right. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word because it continues to teach us and mold us and shape us. So then when we hear these words, when they are preached, when they are taught to us, Lord, help them to change us so that we don't just walk out the door and go back to the lifestyle that we've always lived, but instead we are renewed, we are strengthened, we are healed, we are forgiven, and we are changed. And so that when we go and talk to our neighbor, we, shall, we tell them and we show them that their lives can change that a better life is available to them as well. We don't just want a best life for us, we want a best life for everyone. So we offer up these names, people who are in our family, people who are at our job, people who live in our community, the people that we see in our day-to-day -day life, Lord, these names, these faces, they need you. And they need to know that you love them and that you're in charge. Thank you for giving me my very best life. Thank you for making that available to me each and every day. I am yours. I am yours. I am yours. Amen. Thanks for joining us this week. As always, I want to remind you that uh, we're open. We are open every single Sunday for church, for services, and we'd love to have you. We have two services every single Sunday, one at 9.30, which is our traditional service. We have a choir, and we sing all of your standards, all of your favorite hymns. And then at 11 o'clock, 
We have a contemporary service. We have a worship team. It's a little bit more upbeat. You can come uh, dress casually. Uh, we have a children's program. We have a youth program. In fact, we even have a youth group that meets every Wednesday evening right here at Walden Community Church. Uh, you can send your kid over on their skateboard or their bike. Uh, you can send them over at six o'clock. We will feed them dinner. We will feed them dinner and we will send them home to you at 7.30. It's a fun group of kids that all live in the neighborhood. If your kid has been talking about wanting to do something or they're bored or they want to meet new friends, send them to youth group. We would love to have them. We love new visitors. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.